uh, we're heading into Macbeth for Intro to Literature this week. And unlike um, some of the previous lectures, um, I'm making these lectures so that we can walk through the text together. And I think um, I'm doing that because Shakespeare's language is just likely to be difficult um, for folks who have not ever encountered him before, and even for folks who maybe read a play or two of his in high school. Uh, um, rather than, you know, last week we had Anne Carson's translation of Euripides' text, but because she's translated it to, to such current language, it was probably easier for you to read than Macbeth is. Uh, so there are a couple of things I want to sort of hit, and I'll just be making multiple lectures, and I'm just going to start walking through the beginning of the play um, to later. But uh, just from the outset here, let's think about some questions that um, are related to the play, and these are questions that I, I, some of them I ask you to deal with in discussion posts. Um, and so one question that scholars like to ask is, is the play a pagan play or is it a Christian play? Um, and what they kind of mean by that is, is, is quite interesting because uh, Shakespeare's writing this um, around 1607 and um, he's writing it um, during a time where it's required by law to attend church uh, in England every Sunday. And so uh, 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 there's that. Also England has formed the Anglican Church under, um, uh, not under the current monarch King James, uh, um, but in the previous century. So they've broken away from the Catholic Church uh, and formed their own state. It's a nation. So the church and state are the same thing. It's the Anglican Church, which is different than what you'll get like later Protestant offshoots like Puritans and stuff. They're different from the Anglican Church. Uh, and so it's a Protestant church, uh, but uh uh, King James, if you've ever heard of the King James Bible, right? This is who we're talking about. And that Bible comes out in 1611, but it's well underway as a scholarly activity. Uh, King James the I um, of Scotland who becomes, uh, sorry, King James the Sixth of Scotland who becomes King James I of England um, uh, uh, in the early, around 1602, after Elizabeth dies, um, he fancies himself a scholar of demonology. In fact, he wrote a book that I have here uh, called um, King James's the first uh, demonology, where he studies demonology and witches. And so we want to think about that context with some of the supernatural stuff that's going on in the play. And what's so interesting about Macbeth is that it doesn't really have a lot of overt Christian stuff going on, certainly no characters that are priests or anything like that. And um, at the same time, it, it also, the question is whether or not there's any room for redemption, which is a kind of Christian concept at the end of the play. And one of the reasons why there aren't, you, you might think that there aren't really Christian elements in the play is because it's set back in a pre- uh, a period before Christianity comes to Scotland. And that is something that uh, uh, that Shakespeare was doing intentionally, and I'll have some quotes about that um, from Stephen Greenblatt in a little bit. But uh, so one of the things that, you know, it was really touchy to say anything in a, in a time when you, you had to go to church every Sunday by law, right? And so one of the things that Shakespeare did to give himself more flexibility in the things that he could say on stage was to set his plays in the ancient past, in Roman times, in ancient Scottish times. Um, and by putting that historical distance between um, himself and the current moment, he could actually say things more directly um, to the current moment without necessarily get, risking getting in trouble. So those are some questions to start off with. Is the play a Christian play or is it pagan? Um, is there any room for redemption? Uh, at what point, I ask you guys in discussion posts, at what point for either Macbeth or Lady Macbeth, if you want, is there no more turning back? 
that's a theme that goes on in the in the play the forwardness of of action and what things what things must be and the relationship to fate and action which is of course part of even ancient tragedy uh what is the relationship also i think between being a hero and being a king so we know that macbeth is very accomplished as a soldier on the battlefield we get that from the beginning um, and there are definitely aspirations that he has to be king that come to full flu from fruition uh, throughout the play uh, but does a really good soldier necessarily make a really good leader political leader that's a question to ask and that's something that Shakespeare explores in many plays during this period um, who is fit to be a king who is fit to be monarchy and his his Shakespeare's acting group is called the King's Men. Um, so the main patron of the acting group actually is King James, yet Shakespeare is constantly consumed with this idea of, of sovereignty and what makes a good king. Um, and so there's he's always walking this very kind of political line. Um, so uh, yeah, what is the relationship between being a hero and being a king? Um, heroes are all about action, and that action is associated with manliness throughout the play. So Lady Macbeth worries, as we'll see in, in Act 1 especially, that Macbeth is not man enough at different times, and she associates that man enoughness with doing and acting. And so there's that kind of element of, of action. And, and so, you know, partly what makes a man is some sort of ability to do and act, but Macbeth himself will say at times throughout the play that to overact or to overdo um, exceeds be, what being what a, a man is. Um, and so there's a lot of attention to masculinity and gendered language in the play. And let's just dig into some other concepts uh, um, before we get too far into um, just like the themes of the play. Um, so it's, here's some ideas for thinking about reading Shakespeare. Um, from the get-go. First of all, and this is like po goes for poetry in general, you want to follow punctuation, not line breaks. Um, just like if you were trying to read the play out loud, you wouldn't stop at the end of each line, uh, even though it's written in verse. Look at punctuation, and maybe you're not really great with punctuation, um, uh, like those semicolons or such, but you can treat semicolons like periods um, for this exercise and look look for periods as well. Um, and so you just read sentence by sentence across the line breaks um, rather than attending to the line breaks themselves. Now later on you might want to sort of attend to like the beauty of the line and how Shakespeare does his cutting up of lines and that's something to think about in poetry in general. Uh, but but the line versus the sentence is a good way in. And then the other thing is make sure that you have a text that has clarifying notes at the bottom of the page and read the notes at the bottom of the page. They will help you if you're perplexed throughout the page. It sounds simple, but a lot of times people are like, oh, I can just, if I just keep pushing my way through, I'll be able to get it. Um, Shakespeare's English is modern English. It's not old English or middle English, um, which I'll talk about in a different day. Uh, but it is um, it is modern English, and we can make sense of it, but it will sound a little bit weird to our ears. A lot of times when um, uh, uh, words sometimes end in st, like wouldst thou, um, you can just drop the st. We just we just don't use it in the same way. Um, the the language drops things over time. That's one thing. Language has become more efficient, generally speaking, over time. Uh, and so that the uh, those uh, remarks are actually um, uh, the S's at the end of words for Shakespeare's time. Actually, a lot of times it's going to signal where somebody is from in England or Scotland, for example. Because even today, if you you notice the Scottish accent is different than an English accent, so there's a lot of that going on in Shakespeare's play. Uh, but just in terms of meaning, um, you can just ignore that stuff. Um, hath. H-A-T-H, -H. you can just put the S on at the end, like um, has, That's it's the same word. And it's just because if you put your tongue in your mouth, like to, to make the T-H sound, and you put, try to make an S sound, 
they're really, really close what your tongue is doing. And so it's just a matter of the ears and mouth and how that changes in language over time. Okay. Uh, so another way into thinking about Shakespeare, and just and this is, goes for literature in general, is to think about hermeneutics or liter like, and that's just a fancy word for literary interpretation. And a lot of literary interpretation comes from biblical interpretation because that was kind of what people were reading, um, uh, at least in Europe for a long, long time. Um, and and it could be Christian, and at this and at this stage, it could also mean. But that post-Temple Judaism or Rabbinic Judaism, where they're really dealing with heavy, heavy textual interpretation, um, the development of the idea of scripture. But remember, um, as I said in previous lectures, uh, um, there is no ancient concept of Bible or scripture that comes after the fall, after 70 CE um, or current era, after the fall of the Second Temple. Um, there's these new movements emerging and one of the movements as Christians come to distinguish themselves from Jews um, they also become associated with these codices which are early early forms of the book um, uh, and so uh, there are earlier earlier forms and so like what it would mean to like read a scroll right um, is really different than flipping through pages of a book. Just the reading experience is different. And it gives you a different sense of time or temporality um, in terms of like a book. Like if you're holding a book, you have this kind of forward movement going on. You look from here to the end and you flip the pages this way. And there are ways that that kind of aligns with Christian concepts of, of temporality, of moving towards the end of time or what we call eschatology, the study of end times. Um, uh, and then that gets mapped on with ideas of climax and plot and uh, denouement, as some of you have already done in your in your uh, posts for this week, breaking up in, into Aristotle's terms of like rising action um, and a climax and denouement or resolution. Um, many of you probably started getting that in fifth grade. Uh, so. Uh, post-rabbinic thinkers, so Jewish, both Jewish thinkers and early Christian thinkers like St. Augustine, point to different interpretive layers of a text. And so one way that we can think about this down here, um, if we start at the bottom here, so um, this is how it's often described. And it's going to be different than the way, ways people today often terms the term, use the term literal or especially if people are thinking like theologically like 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 this church or this sect takes the bible literally um that's not really the way that we're using it here what literal means at the layer of the text every text is going to have all of these layers within them um according to um, this this kind of interpretive theory um but at the most basic level is just what happens in the text that's literally concrete what happens here's this character they go here um this is what this character said and that's what that character said and then above that kind of the next layer of interpretation is going to be parable or moral so being able if somebody tells you a parable um or tells you like aesop's fables for example um, there's like a moral at the end of the story. And originally those morals weren't written into Aesop's books, little, uh, fables when they were written down. Um, uh, but when they started getting printed, it became the fashion for a while to print a moral at the end, which it does the interpretive work for you. Um, uh, um, so the being able to draw a moral lesson from the end of the story or to read between the lines, that's going to be parable or moral reading. Um, and then there's allegory or allegorical reading. And that's where you kind of use a collective symbol, um, uh, either of a person who stands in for many people, like an everyman character, um, uh, or reading the whole journey of, or the whole text itself as standing in for a symbol, something like a spiritual journey or spiritual progress. So again, there's like, a, it's come, the, some of this stuff is coming from a very Christian era. And so early Christian books like um, Bunyan's book, Pilgrim's Progress is a really good example of this, where the main character's name is Christian, and he stands in for other Christians. And the progress of the book is his progress towards um, coming to his some sort of a faith journey. 
right? Um, or Dante's Inferno, if we want to go um, to Italy, that's the Italian sort of Renaissance era, um, where it follows the spiritual journey of Dante through the nine circles of hell, and then up through purgatory and into paradise, right? And so there's a kind of sort of big cosmological explanation going on there. So allegories deal with collective types of symbols. Um, and then anagogy, and you probably don't know that word, anagogical is something like the act of enjoying the act of interpretation itself. Um, and it's kind of like communion through prayer or like when you, if you're playing a sport um, or you're writing and like you lose tra all track of time because you get so consumed by the activity itself or like time flies when you're having fun. That's what the anagogical level is. And at least for early biblical interpreters like St. Augustine, the idea is to get to that pure interpretive level within a text itself. Um, so that would be, there's this kind of hierarchy. This is the highest one for, for him. Um, so that's one way to think about it as you're going through text like in a lot of times like the first time you're reading Shakespeare is like you're you're probably looking for just like what the heck happens in the play it's like hard to read who are these people what are their names what they're what are they saying and what happens and then you start maneuvering kind of upwards um, and you can use that scale for poems for short stories for everything that we do in this class um, so if we move on as an example here uh, um, let's start out with the Weird Sisters, who are at the very beginning of, of the play. The play opens on them. Famous, famous um, uh, moment in literary history. Um, thunder and lightning is crashing, and enter three witches. Um, uh, and the first one says, when shall we three meet again in thunder lightning or in rain and so notice the three element there there's three witches and there but she speaks in threes thunder lightning or in rain uh then the second witch when the hurly burly is done when the battle's lost and won that will be ere the set of sun so before the set at the end of the day right um where is the place upon the heath there to meet macbeth i come grimalkin uh and that's another name for like a cat or like a like a like a like an animal accompany accomplice which uh, many witches have and you can see this in harry potter stories or on um, jk rowling stories as well um uh um i come grimalkin uh paddock calls anon foul is fair and fair is foul and foul is fair hover through the fog and filthy air um, so there's a lot of rhyming, like uh, end rhyming or in couplets throughout this speech. Um, and there's a lot of uh, enchanted kind of spell work in the rhythms. Foul is fair, or sorry, fair is foul and foul is fair. Hover through the fog and the filthy air. Um, and so if we look at these characters, they're called the weird sisters. And we have the, the word weird um, in current English, but in Anglo-Saxon or Old English, it's a really old word. So we borrow lots of other words from other languages because English comes to mix with French after the French invasion and all sorts of stuff I'll talk about in later lectures. Um, but in Anglo-Saxon, which we wouldn't be able to understand most of us if we heard it today, um, uh, but we can understand a little bit better if you look at it on the page, um, uh, the word weird shows up. So it's old and for our language. And it comes to be associated with strangeness in general, which that's what we have, like weird. Um, also wayward, um, but also the word, like it's the old English term for fate. Um, so there are these three witches or three sisters who are also standing in for fate. And this is another name for what in Greek is called the Eumenides, um, who are th the, called the three fates. And so we see them throughout classical literature as well, that Shakespeare has adapted them to um, a Scottish environment here. Uh, so they're kind of allegorical in some ways, in the sense, sense that they seem to know what fate is. 
um, uh, their obviously pagan element and, um, in the play as well. Um, but if we think a little bit more specifically towards allegory and that that kind of symbol way of that symbol works where it stands in for a collection of things, um, there's this uh, um, uh, idea of fortune and fortuna, the goddess fortuna, that shows up throughout the play. And so you'll see this in um, so as we go into that that next scene um, here, uh, where uh, King, uh, um, excuse me, King Duncan is talking to Malcolm and to this captain who comes in and they're trying to get news. And so the captain's speech, this is 1.2 in your book. Um, uh, the captain says, doubtful it stood as two spent swimmers that do cling together and choke their art. Uh, the merciless MacDonald worthy to be a rebel for to that the multiplying villainies of nature do swarm upon him from the western isles of Kearns and gallow glasses is supplied and fortune on his damned query smiling uh, showed like a rebel's whore and so uh, there's this like association of, of a, a whore or a strumpet a prostitute with trumpet with, with fortune as well um, and that that happens in a lot of Shakespeare's plays um, so fortune is this goddess who looks down upon people and decides like has a hand in their fate depending on whether or not she's looking kindly on them but there's a lot of resentment to, and misogyny directed toward um, fortuna or woman hating um, uh, um, but all's too weak for brave Macbeth. Well, he well he deserves that name. Disdaining fortune, so he says, "I'm going to throw fortune away. I'm going to try my chances on my own." Uh, disdaining fortune with his brandished steel, which smoked with bloody execution, like valor's minion carved out his passage till he faced the slave, which ne'er took shook hands nor bade farewell to him till he unseamed him so ripped him up um, unseamed him from the nave to the chops took his sword in and went all the way up uh, so really graphic imagery here uh, and fixed his head upon our battlements so he like you know guts this guy cuts off his head and and uh, fixed his head on their spears um, and all the while what he's doing is 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 he's tempting and disdaining fortune and he's kind of making his own way, which is very much part of like a heroic way. Like I'm gonna seize the day. I'm gonna take all of like all of everything up in my own arms and I'm just gonna risk everything. And so that kind of uh, man of action, kind of like ruthless man of action is how we're getting Macbeth being described by this captain in the opening lines. And it's done in terms of fortune. And so Fortuna, I pulled up a medieval image of her here, and she's associated with Fortune's Wheel, or like the game show, Wheel of Fortune, right? Um, and Fortuna is blind, and she's always spinning this wheel. And what we get here is at the top of the wheel, there's the king, but every king falls and becomes a poor pauper or a peasant, um, and then wheels up again. But you don't ever know when Fortune's Wheel is going to change. Um, so Fortuna in the Greek goddess name for Fortuna is Tuke here, um, or luck, goddess of luck or chance. Um, the roll of the dice, uh, that midpoint in, in, in air uh, of what, how are the dice going to fall, right? That's, that's all part of Tuke. Um, and then really closely associated, and this is so interesting, also blind, right, is the goddess Justice, or Eustitia in Latin, or Themis, or Dike in Greek. Um, and blind Justice always holds these scales. So rather than having a whole wheel that goes all the way, what Justice is trying to do is weigh out the balance between fate itself right and so there's always going to be this tension between justice and fate and whether or not humans can control through justice systems um fates themselves right so let me look here if i'm going to read a little bit from uh uh stephen greenblatt's book 
here, uh, Tyrant, which just came out a few years ago. So the timely book comes out in 2018. He's talking about Shakespeare's plays and he's talking about tyrants. And at the same time, there's a particular person who got elected to the US um, president's office. And uh, it seems to be that Stephen Greenblatt is making some subtle and sometimes not so subtle comparisons to um, the person who's still the president of the United States to Donald Trump um, and making it comparisons to a tyrant. So uh, there's like a king, but a tyrant is a particular kind of leader um, who takes um, control. And, and the, one of the opening pages, I'm just going to read from Greenblatt's book here. Uh, he says, Shakespeare understood as well as something that in our own time is, um, Shakespeare understood something that in our own time is revealed when a major event, the fall of the Soviet Union, the collapse of the housing market, COVID-19, we might think, um, uh, a startling election result manages to throw a garish light on an unnerving fact. Even those at the center of the innermost circles of power very often have no idea what is about to happen. Notwithstanding their desks piled high with calculations and estimates, their costly network of spies, their armies of well-paid experts, they remain almost completely in the dark. Looking on from the margins, you dream that if you could only get close enough to this or that key figure, you would have access to the actual state of affairs and know what steps you need to take to protect yourself or your country. But the dream is a delusion. <laughs> so that's what, one way of putting it. Also, I, I recently was trying to like get better at, 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 at um, thinking about money because I'm not really good with money. Uh, and so I took like an online finance course through Great Courses Plus. And this guy who was teaching the course, he was like, everybody thinks that they're going to become a stockbroker. They're going to be able to like, like figure out the market and all this stuff. And it's like, if you think that that's what you're going to do, think again. Nobody is going to be able to control it. Um, and uh, maybe some people get good at it or some people use the new computers move faster than humans can move and all sorts of things there. But if we look at the stock market or our current economy, right, um, after COVID-19, that's a good way of thinking about it. Nobody really could have predicted it you know, a year ago so much. I mean, yes, there were people who warned us about what, what pandemics might happen and stuff like like that so we always think in hindsight could we have addressed things better for sure um, but many most of us I would think like a year ago didn't have like a complete like world lockdown for a few months um, on our maps um, another book that I've been sort of looking at interest like thinking and in, in as I put this class together, is On Kings by David Graeber and Marshall Sellins. And this is a massively thick book. So I'm reading just from the beginning here. Um, he's talking about like what kings are. And I want to think about this with Macbeth and that notion of being a hero. Like he's he's a vicious, violent um, hero. Uh, uh, sorry, soldier. And he's a hero in battle. But he is also... Uh, um, he becomes a king. And so there's that tension between the king and the warrior. They say on page five in their text. On his way to the kingdom, the dynastic founder or the king is notorious for exploits of incest, fratricide, patricide, so killing brothers, killing parents, killing babies or other crimes against kingship and common morality. He may also be famous for defeating dangerous natural or human foes. The hero manifests a nature above, beyond, and greater than the people he is destined to rule, hence his power to do so, to rule over them. However, inhibited or sublimated in the established kingdom, the monstrous and violent nature of the king remains essential, an essential condition of his sovereignty. He can wield power because somewhere deep in, inside of him, the king, there's a kind of viciousness. Indeed, as a sign of the metahuman sources of royal power force, um, 
uh, notably as demonstrated in victory, can function politically as a positive means of attraction as well as a physical means of domination. So this is something I think that Macbeth is very much dealing with um, conceptually as a play. It's like, what is the balance? Is there a possibility? Is it possible to find a balance? Um, there is Macbeth displaying the monstrousness that's inherent, not just in himself, but in, in, in terms of all kings or tyrants themselves. Just some philosophical questions to think about as um, you go through the text. Um, so I'm just going to walk a little bit through um, Act 1. I'm going to have to stop the video in, in about 10 minutes here. Um, and I'll just pick up and keep making videos. And we'll just keep walking through the play. And hopefully this will help accent your reading um, as you move along with me. So we have the Weird Sisters who open Act 1. And then we have this dialogue between the King Duncan, the um, Malcolm, and the Captain who's telling them what happened on the battlefield with Macbeth. Um, uh, um, and of course, King Duncan admires Macbeth. Everybody just thinks he's doing this amazing job out on the battlefield, challenging fate, um, uh, um, thwarting fortune, and still seizing the day. Uh, and more and more troops, the captain says, keep that the Norway, who they're again they're fighting against, keeps bringing in more troops. But Macbeth and Banquo um, are not dismayed. Um, uh, uh, well, they, I mean, they're not. They still win. They're dismayed. So the king says, "Dismayed not this our captains, Macbeth and Banquo." The captain says, "Yes, as sparrows, eagles, or the hare, the lion." Right. It's like, yeah, they, they like they saw these people coming in, but it's like, yeah, they're like, we can take them. Right. Uh, uh, if I say so, if I must report, they were as cannons overcharged with double cracks. So they doubly redoubled strokes upon the foe, except they meant to bathe in reeking wounds or memorize another Golgotha. Um, it's like, like the mount where they crucified the Christian guy. Um, Jesus, um, uh, uh, so all of these crucifixions, a death space, right? Um, uh, except they meant to bathe in reeking wounds or memorize another um, Golgotha, I cannot tell, but I'm faint. My gashes are crying for help. So he's been bleeding, he's been wounded. And the king says, okay, yeah, go, go ahead and get him surgeons. Um, and then uh, Lennox comes in, he's a nobleman, um, and gives them more um, uh, on the battle and uh, the fact that Macbeth has won the battle. Um, and so uh, we get then um, a, a shift in scene and we're back to the witches. Um, uh, thunder again, enter the three witches. Where hast thou been, sister? Killing swine. Sister, where thou? So asking the other sister. A sailor's wife had chestnuts in her lap and munched and munched and munched. Again, that three type language, right? Um, give me, quoth I, um, or ain't the witch, the rump fed Runyon's cries, her husband's to Aleppo gone, master of the tiger, but in a sieve I'll thither sail, and like a rat without a tail, I'll do, I'll do, I'll do. I'll give thee a wind, says the second witch. Thou kind, says the first witch. The third witch says, and I another. Uh, and then the first witch says, and myself have all the other, and the very ports that they blow, all the quarters that they know in, in the shipment's card. I'll drain him as dry as hay. And there's this reference to a succubus, right? Which is a, a ghost that appears to 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 men um, and has sex with them in their dreams and sucks their soul out and incubus is the 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 other gendered version of that right um sleep shall neither day nor night hang upon his penthouse lid he shall live a man forbid weary senites nine times nine so threes and nines right um 81 days shall he dwindle peak and pine through his bark, th sorry, though his bark cannot be lost, yet it shall be tempest-tossed. Look what I have. 
and then the, they, they're back and forth they're showing each other um, these things and and uh, doing these witchy things and their language again does that kind of lots of threes lots of rhyming couplets that incantation type of language a drum a drum Macbeth doth come uh, the weird sisters hand in hand posters of the sea and land thus do go about about thrice to thine and thrice to mine and thrice again to make up nine peace the charms wound up and then Macbeth and Banquo show up and they, they, no, they're not too sure what these witches are. You know, like, are, are you real? Are you ghosts? Like, you look really nasty. Um, and they speak, if you can, says Macbeth, what are thou? Um, or what are you? Uh, all hail Macbeth, hail to thee, Thane of Glamis. All hail Macbeth, hail to thee, Thane of Cawdor, says the second witch. All hail Macbeth thou shalt be king hereafter and so the first one recognizes him as thane of glamis which he is and then the next thane of cawdor which he's not yet and then the third says that he's going to be king um and banquo immediately asks macbeth like 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 why do you start and so we don't see what macbeth's reaction is except through um banquo and he says good sir what why do you start and seem to fear things that do sound so fair like, what are you afraid of? In the name of truth, um, are ye fantastical or that indeed which outwardly ye show? Uh, that's, he's asking this, the weird sisters this. My noble partner, who's Macbeth, uh, you greet with present grace and great prediction of noble having and of royal hope that he seems wrapped with all. To me, you speak not. If you can look into the seeds of time and say which grain will grow and which will not, speak then to me, who neither beg nor fear your favors nor your hate. Like, hey, if you can tell the future, like, tell me mine. My friend here is freaked out by you, but I'm I'm not afraid. Tell me. Um, and the, the, so the, there's these three hails, and then um, lesser than Macbeth and greater, not so happy yet much happier thou shalt get kings though thou be none um so all hail macbeth and banquo banquo and macbeth all hail and what's going on in the play here um kind of the historically is that um macbeth um these are ancient characters these are historical characters in scotland but um king james who was first king james of scotland so he is scottish before he takes the english um throne uh uh he traced his lineage back to banquo and to banquo's family and so by saying you won't become king but you will beget kings um banquo is it is it, it, it's it's giving a kind of privilege and, and shakespeare does some some manipulation of historical sources to make it seem this way and he's because it's because he's trying to make um king james who he knows is going to be in his audience uh uh, feel good and he's got to appease King James because he's borderline doing some satanic stuff on stage right or, or at least pagan stuff on stage so how is he getting away with it like with with doing presenting all of this stuff on stage um, he's got to show something horrible happen to the people who are involved right that's definitely part of this um, and so uh, you know, Macbeth challenges them on the Thane of Cawdor stuff, um, and he's trying to get them to say where they get their information from, and then the witches kind of vanish on him. Uh, and then Banquo says, the earth hath bubbles as the water has, and these are of them. Whither are they vanished? Into the air, says Macbeth. Uh, and what seemed corporal melted as breath into the wind, would that they had stayed. Um, and then they go on to kind of have this banter back and forth with them and and uh, um, Ross comes in and tells them that the king has it announces to them that the king has granted Macbeth um, the title of Thane of Cawdor so immediately the um, weird sisters at least one of their predictions comes true and so this kind of is like you know, freaking out Macbeth and and Banquo um, and and 
they, they, they have these asides to each other um, in 1.3 around, um, around line um, 120-ish. And Macbeth says, Glamis, 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 which he is, and Thane of Cawdor, the greatest is behind, thanks to your, for your pains. And he says aside to Banquo, do you not hope your children shall be kings when, that, when those that give the Thane of Cawdor to me promised no less to them? And Banquo, aside to Macbeth, is like, that trusted home might yet enkindle you to, unto the crown, besides the thane of Cawdor, but tis strange, and oftentimes to win us to our harm, the instruments of darkness tell us truths, win us with honest trifles to betray, um, to betrays in deepest consequence. Cousins, a word, I pray you. And so he speaks, they're having these kind of a side talk, and then, and then he, he goes back to talk to Ross and Angus. Um, and Macbeth says, like, well, you know, I'm not exactly sure what to do with this. Um, as happy tongue prologues to swelling act of the imperial theme, I thank you, gentlemen. He says this kind of to, directly to them. And then aside kind of to himself, he says, this supernatural soliciting can't be ill. It can't be all bad, but it can't be all good. If it's bad, then why has it given me success? Right. Um, and can, why is it told the truth? I am Thane of Cawdor now. Um, but if it's good, why do I feel this kind of sinking in my chest? Why do I, in my, this knock at my ribs? Um, and then notice how this language with chance and for, fortune here show up with him. And I'll end this segment on this. Uh, if chance will have me king, why chance may crown me without my stir. And so he's thinking like, maybe I don't have to do anything to be king. Maybe it's just going to be fortune. I should leave it up to fortune. Now, remember, he's been described by the captain as the guy who's disdaining fortune on the battlefield. But he has this hesitation and he's going to have these hesitations about, do I need to do anything special to make myself become king? Or if it's fated, why do I have to do anything to make it happen? Right. And so there's this wrestle, wrestling between something like free will and um, for, fortune or chance and fortune. And uh, so if we compare that on one side, chance and fortune, what do I do or do I just let things happen? And then on the other side, we're thinking about justice, which tries to have a kind of balance so that the whole wheel doesn't tip all the way around. Uh, think about that as you're reading. I'll do more walking through Act 1. I just went a little bit today. Um, but this just gets us an intro to the play. So we'll just take a little pause now and I'll edit some stuff together as I make future um, uh, future lectures. Thanks.